And I've entitled this message, The Writing is on the Wall. The Writing is on the Wall. How many of you have heard that phrase, uh, the writing is on the wall? Right? So that phrase, it just simply means something unpleasant is about to happen. It's like the writing's on the wall. I'm about to get fired. The writing's on the wall. This good thing is about to end. It comes from this story in Daniel chapter 5, where God again does, he reveals himself in an amazing and kind of creepy way. So let's read this story. Daniel chapter 5, starting in verse 1. So King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles. They drank wine and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold, the silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so the king and his nobles, his wives, his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem and the king and his nobles, his wives, his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. The king called for the enchanters, the astrologers, the diviners to be brought in and said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple, that's a royal color, and have a gold chain placed around his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. All the king's wise men came in but none of them could read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. Oh, king, live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight, intelligence, and wisdom like that of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, I say, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. This man Daniel, Daniel, who the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel and he will tell you what the writing means. Verse 13, Daniel was brought before the king and the king said to him, are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard the spirit of the gods is in you and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for your word. God, we believe it's more than a collection of good stories, but God, it is your story. It is your living and active word. And we pray that through this story today, God, you bring it to life once more in our hearts, our minds, our spirits. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to receive. Lord, may your anointing be upon me that I would only speak what you desire me to speak, nothing more, nothing less. May we walk out of here different than when we came in, having encountered your presence, your power, your word. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have this shift suddenly in the story, in the book of Daniel. Chapter 4 ended with Nebuchadnezzar having humbled himself and praising God, and then all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar is no more. So what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? His story ended. Well, he ruled for 43 years. He started in 605 BC, which was the first uh, of the three exiles. That's, that's when Daniel and his friends likely were brought to Babylon in 605 BC. He reigned for 43 years until his death in 562 BC. Now, Belshazzar took over in 555, so within those seven years, Babylon had four different kings. Some think maybe five, but there was a man named Merodach who was 
pretty evil. He only he served for two years. Then he was assassinated by his brother-in-law, uh, Nera Glasser, who served for four years. And then there was a man named Labashi Marduk who served for like a month or two before there was a coup brought against him and he was usurped of his power. And one of the conspirators who was part of that coup then became the king, a man named Nab Nabonidus. Nabonidus. But Nabonidus didn't even want to be a king. But yet his group, this group that, that formed this coup and took over, they kind of appointed him as the king, so he took over. But he, he didn't really want the authority, so he gave the authority to his son, Belshazzar. And Nabonidus, it said, went into the, the Arabian desert and lived there while his son was king. This was hundreds of miles away from Babylon. So there's 22 years between chapter 4 and chapter 5, and yet chapter 5, it takes all of one day. Chapter 5 addresses one whole day, and that's it. So Belshazzar, it says in, in the Bible that he's the son of Nebuchadnezzar. He was not actually the actual son, but when you see son in the Bible, what it really means is a descendant, an ancestor. He could be a grandson, a great-grandson, but he was not the direct son of Nebuchadnezzar, but he was in the line of Nebuchadnezzar, and that's how kings worked, that there were no elections, that whoever was next in line took over. So Belshazzar takes over, and he's the second in the kingdom. That's why he says whoever can interpret this dream will be the third, because his dad is number one, but he doesn't really want to be king. And so Belshazzar is number two. And if anyone can interpret this dream, Belshazzar says, I will make you the third highest ruler in Babylon. Now chapter five parallels chapter two in a lot of ways, where Nebuchadnezzar had his first dream of the the, the image that had gold and silver and, and bronze and clay that represented four different kingdoms. Because by the end of chapter 5, Babylon falls. After this day ends, Babylon will be no more. They will be overtaken by the Persians and the Medes. But while Babylon falls, Daniel continues to be in a position of influence. And it tells us that kingdoms come and go. Kingdoms have come and gone uh, pretty much since the beginning of time, and they will continue to come and go, but the kingdom of God is everlasting. The kingdom of God will never end, and those that trust in him, those that trust in the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of the world, will maintain their influence. Because at any point, if Daniel or Shadrach or Meshach or Abednego did not trust God, Two things would have happened. Either they would have lost their lives, right, by trying to take it into their own hands, and they would have got killed, or they would have become like the Babylonians. But they trusted God in the midst of it. They had high character. They didn't, they didn't try to make it happen themselves, and God showed up and continued to give them influence in this foreign kingdom. So here we have the story of the writing on the wall. So Belshazzar, is, he's holding this royal party, right? He's, he invites a thousand of his closest friends. Okay, how many of you have a thousand close friends? He invites all these important people, right? All the nobles, all the VIPs in the area, and they're living it up. They've got wine, they've got women. Now, normally, the king would not bring his wives and concubines before other men, unless they were eunuchs. If you don't know what a eunuch is, ask your neighbor. Don't Google it, okay? Please, don't Google it. But here he brings all these women in. He's got these nobles. They're, they're drinking. They're having a good time. But notice what they're doing. They're not just drinking wine. What are they drinking the wine out of? The vessels that were taken from the temple of God. These vessels that were sacred, temp sacred vessels to the Jews. They were drinking wine out of it and praising not God, but the gods of Babylon, the gods of gold and silver and iron and bronze. So Belshazzar was blatantly setting himself against God. He was blatantly saying to God, I don't think you have any power. We're going to take your stuff, we're going to use it the way we want, and we're going to praise our gods and not you. So this is reminiscent of chapter 2. 
this dream of the statue of the gold, silver, iron, etc. But what happened there was it was destroyed. But Belshazzar, he's still blatantly setting himself and Babylon's gods against the God of Israel. Right? Remember, this book is about God's sovereignty and God's about to show him that he is sovereign still. What Belshazzar is doing here, he's not doing this in ignorance. He's not doing this like, oh, I didn't know. He's blatantly mocking God. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes, Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. A person reaps what they sow. That's New Testament. Say, look, if you mock God, if you blatantly set yourself up against God, you will be humbled, right? The Bible says those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So all of this, again, is really about humility or the lack of humility among these kings. So Belshazzar, he's blatantly sticking his thumb, at, you know, thumbing his nose at God. He said, yeah, you're nothing. We're going to take your stuff. We're going to drink out of it, have a big party. We're going to praise our own gods. And sometimes when you read the Bible, and this is just in, in my mind, I don't know that it actually happened this way, but I like to think sometimes of God just kind of messing with people. Where God sees all this going on, and he's sovereign, so he's not, he's not scared. But I wonder if he just sat around with some of the angels, some of the people of heaven, and said, hey, watch this. I'm going to scare the crap out of this dude. And so this disembodied hand shows up. A floating hand with no body on it, okay? Now he scared the pants off of Belshazzar. I didn't really wear pants back then, but he scared him, right? He terrified him. He said he was so scared that his knees were knocking and it, his, his legs were given out. Like he couldn't stand. He was so terrified. This disembodied hand shows up and just begins writing on the wall. Any one of us that saw that we would have freaked out too. Okay, like that's, that's Hollywood. That's something you see in a, a Halloween movie where a disembodied hand just starts writing stuff on the wall. But that's what God's doing. I like to picture God doing it kind of sarcastically. <laughs> Look at this. This is really going to get him. But he does. He, he, he reveals himself in this very dramatic way. The disembodied hand shows up, begins writing, and he is terrified. So... Like Nebuchadnezzar before him, he turned to the wise men of Babylon. He brings in all the diviners, all the astrologers, every, everyone he could. Right? Isn't that what happens when people find themselves just as scared as they can be? They could be an atheist. They start crying out to God in that moment, don't they? Because when you're in that moment, when you're so terrified... You're hoping that God's there. You're hoping there's someone. So he's, he's turning to his wise men. He's bringing everybody in. Hey, anyone that can tell me this, I will make you the third highest ruler in the kingdom. But once again, these wise men are no help. They cannot interpret this. They cannot even read the writing, let alone interpret what it means. You know, we keep hearing about these wise men of Babylon, but... It doesn't seem like they're very wise because they don't do anything. They don't get anything right. And yet, just like Belshazzar, there are people today, including us sometimes, that we keep turning to things that never work. We keep turning to ways that never help instead of turning and trusting God, turning to and trusting God. Because our flesh gets in the way. We, we believe in God here, but we have a hard time sometimes putting that into practice and truly trusting God in those tough situations. So do you notice a pattern throughout the book of Daniel? God speaks in these ways that can only be revealed by him. He shows the uselessness, the worthlessness of Babylon's gods and their inability to do or provide anything for them. It's only God and his followers that can reveal these things because God is the only true God. And so Belshazzar brings in all the wise men. None of them can interpret it and now he's even more terrified. He was scared before but now he's like, what do I do? No one can tell me what this means. But then the queen, she only shows up for these two verses. 
But the queen shows up, verses 10 through 12, and she says, O king, live forever, which he was about to literally die that night, so forever wasn't going to last very long. The king, live forever. There's actually a guy in this kingdom whom your father, Nebuchadnezzar, your ancestor, your, like the king before you, there's a man who he turned to that helped him interpret dreams and visions, and you should reach out to him. Now remember, what was Belshazzar doing in the beginning? He was thumbing his nose at God. Now he's going to turn to one of God's men for the answer. But he's so terrified that he, he's not playing that game anymore. He'll, he'll take whatever he can get. So God, God makes a way for there to be an answer. But he had to turn to the right place, turn in the right direction. Instead of turning to the Babylonian wise men, the queen points him to Daniel. Who all these years later, his reputation still remained. His reputation preceded him as someone that was wise, as someone that was wiser than any of Babylon's wise men. Now by this time, he likely didn't have the same authority that Nebuchadnezzar had given him. But people knew, some people still knew who Daniel was and they knew what he could do. So the queen points Belshazzar to Daniel. So here's one thing you learn in reading the book of Daniel is that the worldly kingdom cannot lead us to the kingdom of God. The worldly kingdom will never be one and the same with the kingdom of God until Jesus returns and makes it so. That's why the Bible tells us in the, New, in the New Testament, Jesus says you cannot serve both God and mammon or both God and money. He said you can't serve two kingdoms at the same time. We are kind of in two kingdoms at the same time, but we can only serve one. If we're serving the kingdom of the world, we cannot serve the kingdom of God. The king needed someone to point him in the right direction. He was looking to the worldly kingdom and he needed to look to the godly kingdom. That's what the church is to do today. We're to point the world to God through Jesus, his character, his way of life, a life that was led and empowered and informed by the Holy Spirit. Daniel had the spirit of God. Daniel had the character of God. Now to Nebuchadnezzar and to Belshazzar, he had the spirit of the gods. But what he really had was the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit who is God. The king needed the queen to point him to Daniel and then Daniel pointed him to God. See, all throughout the book of Daniel, we see that his character, his faith, caused others, caused officials and commanders, kings and queens, to see him as trustworthy, to see him, even as an exiled Jew, as someone they could trust. This story would not have happened without the queen to point Belshazzar to Daniel. So even if you are not a Daniel, you say, well, I don't have gifts like Daniel has, every single one of you can be like the queen and point people in the right direction. You can point people to the kingdom of God. You know, Daniel, like I said, his reputation preceded him, not only as a wise person, but as a trustworthy person, as a person of high character, he earned his influence, not by force or political means, but he earned his influence simply by trusting God and obeying God. In that way, he was similar to Joseph. If you remember Joseph in the book of Genesis, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. Right? He had a dream that he was going to rule over them, and they said, nope, not going to happen. They got him out of there, told their dad that he, that he was killed, and so Joseph begins a life of slavery. He ends up being a servant in the house of Potiphar. And because he, he continues to honor God, he earns a high place in Potiphar's house until Potiphar's wife tries to get him to sleep with her and he will not. And she falsely accuses him of trying to sleep with her. So then he gets imprisoned falsely. And while there, God uses him to, to speak to prisoners to speak to the Pharaoh and eventually Joseph became the second in command in Egypt and did save his family. Daniel has a very similar story. He was taken into exile, taken out of his home and yet because of his trust in the Lord, God rose him 
God brought him into a position of influence in this foreign kingdom. So verse 13 through 16, we see the king now speaking with Daniel, and he says this, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles that my father the king brought from Judah? This was kind of a put down. He's like, are you Daniel, one of those people? Are you one of those exiles? He's like, am I really having to trust in one of those people? And he had already mocked Daniel's God. He had mocked Judah's God. And now it was one of God's own people that was the only one that could help him. Daniel, in his mind, was a cast-off Jew. Daniel was despised by people like this king and people like him. But today it's another cast-off Jew who is despised by many, whom hold, who holds the key, the answer to everything, and that cast-off Jew is Jesus. Right? Daniel is a type of Jesus in this book. And so now Daniel begins to interpret the dream. Let's pick up the story in verse 17. It said, Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. O king, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor because of the high position he gave him. All the people and nations and men of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. Those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was, dis he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all the kingdoms of men and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from the temple brought to you, and you, you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze, iron, wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote this inscription. So before we get to that, we see here Daniel doesn't just go in and interpret the writing on the wall just yet. Instead of giving him the what, the first thing Daniel does is tell him why God is doing this. And so he tells him the story. He reminds him of his, his great-grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. He reminds him of, of Nebuchadnezzar's pride and arrogance that brought him to a place of judgment where God humbled him. He had an arrogant heart. His, his, his pride welled up. He lost his position. He became like an animal in mind and in lifestyle until he acknowledged that God indeed was sovereign over all kingdoms, including his. And then he shifts into Belshazzar and says, you are doing the same thing. You have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. And that's a key phrase that we're going to come back to in just a minute. He said, you have not humbled yourself, even though you knew all of this. So knowing all of this, Belshazzar still set himself up against God. He mocked God. He praised gods that cannot hear, see, or understand. And he made a mockery of the God of Israel. The one, Daniel says, who holds your life and your ways in his hands. This is why the vision came, Daniel said. And now he's telling him the what. Like, here's what it means. Verse 25, this is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, to kill Parsin. This is what these words mean, Mene. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. To Kel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. 
Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the, the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So what we see here is that without the why, the what loses its meaning. If Daniel had just jumped in and said, this is what it means, Belshazzar might have, well, why is he telling me this? We need to know the why so that the what has meaning. And sometimes what happens is we seek out the what. We want the revival. We want the awakening. We want all this stuff. And God says, you need to know why these things are happening. You need to understand why you're in this position to begin with. Because if I give you the other stuff, it's going to lose its meaning if you don't understand why. And I wonder how, many how much time we've wasted doing things and sometimes even praying when God is saying, I'm trying to tell you why. You're wanting to do all these things and you're wanting to make something magically happen, but you need to understand this first. There's a verse in Zechariah. I believe it's chapter 7, uh, where he, God says to the people, he says, when, you, when I called, you did not listen. So when you call, I will not listen. Now the first time I remember coming across that passage, I thought, man, that's pretty petty of you, God. It's like, well, you won't listen to me, so I'm not listening to you. Blah, 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 blah. Right? That, that's what kids do. But if you look at the context, that's not what God is doing. God is saying, I have spoken to you, and until you listen to and obey that thing, like there's nothing else to give you because that's the thing you need to do. And until that thing is done, you can do all these other things you want, but I don't need to listen because you're not listening to the one thing you need to do. And I wonder how many times we start doing stuff and we do it with the right intention and we're, we're getting passionate about this and God's saying, and you're wasting your time because you're still not listening to the first thing I told you, the first thing I wanted for you. And so he tells Belshazzar the why. He said, this is happening because you, like your father, did not humble yourself. And then he interprets the writing, which was actually in Aramaic, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parsin. All these kind of have a double meaning. They're, um, they're money. Right? Uh, tekel is a shekel. Uh, mene is a mina. And uh, Parsin is half a mina. So what he's really... And then he says, your days are numbered. He, it, it said it twice. Mene, Mene, your days are numbered. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting or lacking, found deficient. Right? What was he lacking? Humility. He was deficient in humility. And in Parsin or Perez, which is just the singular form of it, your kingdom has been divided, right? The half minor, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So he's basically saying to Belshazzar, because of your love for money and power and your contempt for God and your lack of humility, your kingdom tonight is coming to an end. Now, the interesting thing is Belshazzar seems to resign himself to the judgment proclaimed. He takes the purple robe anyway that Daniel said, I don't want, and he puts it on him. He takes the gold chain and he puts it on him. And that very night, Belshazzar was killed. Now, it's kind of odd because what was happening at this time were the Medes and the Persians, their armies were actually outside of the city. Right, Babylon had these big walls, and so he's inside partying it up, even though these armies were out there. He assumed that, well, we have this big wall, like we're protected here, the Euphrates was flowing through, it's like we got water, like we're good. But what actually happened was the Peds and the Persians, uh, the, the, the Medes and the Persians, not the Peds and the Persians, the Medes and the Persians, what their armies did is they diverted the Euphrates into a canal. They made the water so that they could actually walk through it. It just went up to like their knees or their thighs and they walked right under the walls through the river and they had this surprise attack now on the Babylonians and Belshazzar died that very night right after hearing the interpretation of these words. Very soon after he died, he was slain. See, the why in this story is much more important than the what. 
We like to focus on, on the dreams and the visions and all those amazing things. But more important to Daniel was him understanding why this was happening. As I said, often we look for a what when God wants to reveal to us a why. And through that why, he then points us to a who. He points us to a person, to Jesus, not to a program, not to a policy, not to a something of the worldly kingdom. He points us to Jesus. He points us to a carpenter from Nazareth, a cast-off Jew that many despised, yet who became the Savior of the world. So one of the questions you might ask is, look, Nebuchadnezzar, God gave him a chance to repent. Why did he not give Belshazzar the same opportunity? Seems unfair. The key to that is in verse 22. And in verse 22, Daniel says to him, but you, Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. In the beginning, Nebuchadnezzar could kind of claim ignorance. Right? He didn't really know Israel's God. But now there was enough story that the queen knew who Daniel was. Belshazzar likely knew the stories of Nebuchadnezzar, knew some of the amazing things that God had done while he was king. He said, you knew all of this, and yet you still did what you did. He knew but refused to acknowledge. Worse than that, he mocked God. He desecrated the temple vessels while praising Babylon's gods. And so that very night, he lost his life. Knowing means nothing without humility. Education is nothing without humility. Power is nothing without humility. Policies are nothing without humility. All these things are nothing without humility and an acknowledgement that God is sovereign over all. And that God appoints whoever he wants to over his kingdoms, but it's still his kingdom. The power is still his, the authority is still his. There's a lot of stories throughout history of people knowing something and disregarding what they knew. The story of the Titanic, the story goes that the captain of the ship knew there was an iceberg in their way, but it didn't move in time. People assumed their ship was indestructible. People lost their lives. There's a story of Joe Kennedy Jr. in World War II who uh, he, he was the, the older, or he's the, the nephew of JFK, of John F. Kennedy. So he, he ran these, these PB-24 um, bombers and they were drones. So in 1944, they had these drones. So the plan was they were gonna fly above this particular spot and he and his other pilot were going to eject. And once they were safely away, that plane, that bomb was going to be remote controlled into its destination. But there was an officer that, that told Joe Kennedy Jr., he said, this thing is very unstable. If you hit turbulence or if something happens just right, this could blow up while you're in it. You should abort this mission. But he did not abort the mission and that's exactly what happened. While they were in the plane, it blew up over England in August of 1944. See, you can know stuff, but if you don't do the right thing with what you know, then it doesn't matter. With knowledge, we need to have humility. We need to have an acknowledgement that God is sovereign. I can't, I can't take the reins and say, oh, God, I got this. You sit this one out. That's not how it works. So both Kennedy and his co-pilot were blown out of the sky that day. Maybe their lives would have been spared had they listened, had they maybe done some more work or looked at it more to make sure it was safer. See, knowing is one thing, but responding accordingly is another. God has given us everything we need, but he's given us free will, so we must make the right choices. Ezekiel chapter 36, 24 to 27 the prophet, God speaks to the prophet Ezekiel about how he's going to give his people a new heart. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna replace the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'm gonna put my spirit in you to help you know my ways, to help you obey my word. See, when God speaks of the new covenant 
And he says, I'll give you a new heart and I'm going to put the law in your heart. He doesn't say you're going to automatically just do all the right stuff. He says, I'm going to give you everything you need. You absolutely can make the right decision. You absolutely can live a life without sin. You can live a life that is obedient to God. But you can't do that without humbling yourself and without trusting the Holy Spirit that God has given you. That when the Spirit speaks and says, don't do that, when you have that feeling that says, oh, I shouldn't, don't do it. But when you, when you have that push to say, you need to go do this, then go do it. Trust that spirit that God has given you. Because God wants to do something. God wants to show up the same way that he showed up in the faith of Daniel and in the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 1 Corinthians 1 in verse 18, I want to read just a few verses here and we're just about to close. If you know anything about the story of Corinth, they were a very, especially the first letter to the Corinthians, they were a very divided church. They were divided among the people they were following. In fact, Paul says in one place, he said, you say, one says they follow Paul, another says they follow Apollos, another says they follow Peter, and yet another says they follow Christ. He's like, is Christ divided? It's like, we're supposed to be one church and everyone's got their, like they're picking their favorite, their favorite prophet, they're picking their favorite apostle to follow. And he says this to begin the, the, the passage, for the message of the cross is foolishness, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. But it goes beyond that. See, Daniel was the cast-off Jew that God used to speak to the kings of Babylon and Persia. Today, Jesus is the cast-off Jew that God uses to speak to all people and kingdoms today. So Corinth was this intensely divided church. Paul, Apollos, Peter, Christ, you know, they all say, well, I follow him, I follow him. But the cross represented weakness to those who are perishing. But even more specific, Paul says this. I'm going to start in verse 22. It says, Jews demand miraculous signs. And the Gentiles look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, who is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than, than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. So what he's saying here is that the cross, even to the Jews, it represented weakness. And this is why in Deuteronomy chapter 21, so this is in the, in the law, it talks about anyone who, like, when a man's killed and hung on a tree, it says they are cursed. A hanged man is cursed by God. So Jews who were truly loyal to the law would have looked at Jesus on the cross and said he is cursed. He cannot be a savior if he's been hung on a tree. If he's been hung on a wooden cross. He could not be a savior. So to them, the cross was weakness. The cross was a curse. But God takes the weak things of the world and he shows his power, his sovereignty. But for the Gentiles, for the Greeks, the cross was foolishness because for them, they were all into philosophy and wisdom. You think of the, the great Greek philosophers, like that's where they were in this time. And so for them, it was all about philosophy and wisdom and education. So, well, the cross is foolish. That has, that's not wise. You can't learn anything from that. So for both Jews and Gentiles, the cross was Foolish in different ways. And yet Paul says, but that same cross is the power of God and it is the wisdom of God. It represents true power. That self-sacrifice represents true power. Jesus submitting himself to the Father, he, he believed wholeheartedly that the Father would raise him from the grave. He knew the character of his Father that because he was blameless and innocent, death could not hold him down. He trusted the character of his father that if he gave himself up, it would not be long before he was raised to life. So Jesus operated in wisdom because he trusted the character of his father. 
The Jews were looking for a powerful Messiah, one that would come in force. They wanted signs of that power. Gentiles wanted style. They wanted wisdom. They wanted education. They wanted these wise philosoph this wise philosopher type Messiah. But Jesus represents both the power and the wisdom of God through the cross. The cross is God's power. The cross is God's wisdom. For Jesus knew his death would be overturned because he knew the Father's love and character. He knew that God was just. He knew that the Father is good. He knew that the Father is sovereign. This is wisdom. This is power. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they believed their God was sovereign, so they surrendered themselves to the fire. Daniel believed his God was sovereign, so he took the opportunity to pray for the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He took the opportunity to, to pray for the interpretation for Belshazzar's vision. It took Daniel years to earn the influence that he had in the kingdom. And he kept having to show himself trustworthy of that. All it would have taken was one fleshly, selfish action. One time trying to be forceful about it and rebel, it would have ruined all that he had built. It would have ruined any chance he would have had to speak into the life of any king, of any person in general. He likely would have lost his life. And yet Daniel simply trusted the Lord, he trusted that God was sovereign. He trusted that no matter what power came against him in the world, that God was bigger than that. And that if he surrendered himself to God, that God would raise him up. If he humbled himself, God would exalt him. But the key to all this, because you notice in all of these stories, what they say of Daniel, he has the spirit of the gods. Now as we read it, we know he didn't have the spirit of Babylonian gods. He had the Holy Spirit of our God. He had the Holy Spirit who is God within him. And you know what? So do you. If you are a believer in Christ, if you're a professor of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Right? You're given the Spirit through Christ's death. But then there's that, what we believe as Pentecostals, there's that, that second that second act of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, where there's an even fuller, an even fuller experience of the Holy Spirit. And I've used this picture before, and it seems to be the one that people understand the most, so I, I don't, I'm not trying to be crass with it. But if you, if you look at salvation as kind of the wedding day, right? Salvation, when you commit yourself, you make the pledge to follow Jesus, it's like standing up on your wedding day and committing to your spouse. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is like the wedding night. It's the consummation of that marriage. You don't become more saved when the Holy Spirit comes upon you in that way, but the relationship changes. You don't become more married when you, mar when you consummate the marriage, but the relationship definitely changes. There's an intimacy that you have now that you didn't have before. You, you can live your life without the baptism of the Spirit and God is with you but I'm telling you, there's a whole lot you miss out on. It's like, it's like being married, but never really having that intimate connection. You, you could do that, but there's gonna be some, right? It's just gonna be those times where like, man, I just want more. And God has more for us. And it's that Holy Spirit that's gonna make us distinctive. Like even back in Exodus, before the Spirit came at Pentecost, God was telling, he was mad at, at the Israelites. He told Moses, you know, just, like, just take him out, just go. And Moses said, no, God, if your spirit doesn't go before us, don't send us. Like, I don't want to go there. That's what separates us. How will people know that we're yours if they don't see the spirit of God working in our midst? And folks, that's what we need today. Our culture is not going to change with some policies. It's not going to change with some laws. Hearts are not going to change unless they're changed by the Spirit of God. Your commission and my commission is to make disciples, and we can't do that with the things of the world. We do that through the Holy Spirit. We do that through the power of the Spirit within us. I'm going to pray, and there's three things we're going to do. One, for those that, that respond and say, I, I want that 
I want that experience with the Holy Spirit. I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to seek that. There's going to be a, an opportunity for you to, to come forward and, and to pray for that. For some of you, you may need to start with the acknowledgement that God is sovereign. And you may need to say, I've got to quit doing things my own way. Lord, you're sovereign. I want to walk in humility. And you might need to repent, surrender, sacrifice of any allegiances or loyalties that you have outside of God. We need the attitude, the heart, the faith of Daniel. We need faith in this time of exile. Do you close your eyes? So we have those three questions. The first question, if you're here today, and if you say, I've been living on my own, I've been doing it my own way, I have not acknowledged God's sovereignty in my life, I have not turned to Him for hardly anything, and that needs to change today. If that's you, would you raise a hand in honesty and say, that's me, and I want to pray today, I want to change that. Thank you, a couple of you. So I'm, I'm remaking that commitment today. The second question I would ask is how many of you recognize in order for me to do that, I've got to lay down some allegiances I have that aren't God. I'm putting my hope and faith in things. I'm trying to do it all myself and I'm, I'm, I've got my allegiances elsewhere like Nebuchadnezzar did and like Belshazzar did and but I want, to, I want to begin walking in that humility. If that's you, would you raise a hand? Several hands there. And then the final thing. And if you raise your hand here, I'm going to invite you to come forward later. I'm not going to make you. One of the biggest differences. Now, this isn't a magic, this isn't a magic pill. It's not a magic formula that if it happens, boom, you're perfect. But if you've never had this the second experience with the Holy Spirit, this baptism of the Holy Spirit. What often happens, if you read through the book of Acts, what often happens when the Holy Spirit comes on them, when it gives a specific act, they start speaking in other languages, speaking in other tongues. And I know that, that for some of you, they say, oh, that's really weird. And, you know, those tongues are more... The vast majority of the time that I speak in tongues, it's, it's in my private prayers. But you also have to know this. For the disciples to know that something had happened, that the gift of the Spirit had come, they needed a true, a true sign that something significant had just occurred. Because otherwise, well, did it happen? Is this, and so God provides this very clear sign that something has happened. Now, God doesn't hold back. God doesn't say, well, you've got to show me these five things before I'll give it. He says, all you got to do is ask and receive. And some people struggle to receive because it, they, it's still confusing in their mind. But if you think of it in, in this way, right, when you came to the Lord and you made that commitment, it's like your marriage, your wedding day, you committed before to Him in that day. But that consummation of the marriage, that's, that's a different level to the relationship. And so it, it feels different, right, than just standing with your spouse at the altar on the wedding day. There's a different feeling. There's a different experience. So there's a different experience when you experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you saw the hands. And I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hands for this last one. But if that's you, I want you to come forward. You, Lord, you saw the hands for, all, for those questions. And you know those that right now are... Maybe they're wrestling with, well, I want that, but God, I don't know what it is. I don't, I'm afraid of what it means. I don't know what I'm going to experience. But Lord, if we truly want to, to impact this world, to impact the worldly kingdom the way that Daniel and his friends did, it's only through the power of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, when he came to this earth as a man, was able to do what he did because of the Holy Spirit within him. His ministry did not start until the Spirit came down upon him. He was baptized in the water and then the, the heavens opened up and the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Then his ministry started. If even Jesus did not start his ministry until the Spirit had clearly come upon him, why would we ever try to do anything, Lord, for the kingdom of God without knowing and believing the Spirit of God was in us and leading us? I know the Holy Spirit is within every single one of us. But it's this, it's this 
the second experience, God, that really just opens a, a different level of intimacy, a different level to the relationship. For those who acknowledge this, that I, I gotta quit trusting in myself, God, do a work in their heart today that they don't leave here um, without taking some kind of step. And then for those who, who want to seek the Holy Spirit, Lord, give them the courage and the boldness to do so, to come forward, to say, okay, I don't, maybe I don't know what this is, but I want it and I'm gonna open myself. I want you to pray for me. And Lord, we're gonna do that. We're gonna pray and we're gonna trust that you're gonna just move in their hearts. Lord, this world needs Daniels. This world needs Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You, if you can reach the Nebuchadnezzars of the world, Lord, you can reach anyone. So we put our trust and our hope in you. We love you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.